Hello, we're here with Lord Turner, Senior Fellow at INET. Thank you very much for being here with us in Toronto. I'm very pleased to be with you. So you've been with us for many years now. Mm. What is new economic thinking to you? Well, partly new economic thinking is about thinking about what went wrong in 2008. I mean, I think it is extraordinary that we had this amazing financial crisis from which we are still attempting to recover and very slowly. And it is true that an awful lot of modern macroeconomics, when you look back, was unfortunately useless at telling us you know, why this event occurred. Uh, what is then intriguing to me is that when you try and think about why it occurred, at one level you've got to do some new economic thinking. At another level, some of the most interesting stuff is to reread some really old classics, whether it be Knut Wicksell or Friedrich Hayek or, or Keynes or Minsky. There is a lot of thinking there. And uh, I, in the forthcoming book I'm writing on this, I entitle one chapter, The Strange Amnesia of Modern Macroeconomics. We forgot a lot of stuff which uh, was familiar to an earlier generation of economists. Yes, absolutely, and that's part of the work that INET's doing, is trying to bring back those, those, uh, those thinkers and those themes in a way to inform the current debate. Mm -hmm. Right now, six years from the crisis, a lot of the debate has tended to move toward the issue of inequality. Mm -hmm. As we see QE held passive values, and which have recovered, real estate has recovered, and you've recently um, delivered a lecture at Cass mm -hmm. Business School where you're a visiting professor on this. Where do you think this debate is going? Well, I... At the, my, Cass lectured, I set out four big trends, which are really quite startling when you set them out on uh, you know, one exhibit for each, and, and they're these. One, a dramatic rise in inequality. So in the US, uh, bottom quarter of the population, no real wage increase for 25 years, top 1%, increase of 300%. The second phenomenon which uh, Thomas Piketty has drawn our attention to is this dramatic increase in the ratio between wealth and income. So wealth to income ratios in advanced economies going from sort of two to three back in uh, 1970 to six or even seven today. The third is the amazing increase in leverage over the last 50 years. US private sector leverage, household and company combined, was about 50% of GDP in 1950, and it reaches 170% of GDP by 2008, and we see similar trends in other advanced economies. And then the final one, which is a 15-year trend, or a 20-year trend, so slightly shorter than the others, but still dramatic, is the fall in real risk-free interest rates. So late 80s, uh, real risk-free interest rates, say on a 20-year uh, US T bond, an index T bond, 3%, uh, 3.5%, even before the crisis, even in 2007, these have fallen to about 1% or 1.5%, uh, which are historically low within the whole of the history of, of modern market economies. And what I tried to do in my CAS lecture is say, what's going on here? Can we uh, link the, the dots? Can we link the story uh, between these four things? And I believe that out of that link uh, comes really a, a picture of an economy which is really changing in shape in ways which we're not thinking enough about. Thinking about the history for a second, one of the arguments that some people make when confronted with the inequality data specifically, and your second point that you just brought up, is that you know, we're just going back to previous levels of inequality. So pre levels of inequality that were there in society before the wars. Mm -hmm. So do you think that's a possibility that we should consider? Or do you think that socially we're a different place right now? Well, at one level it's clear we are going back to the same levels of inequality of uh, income and indeed wealth that existed, say, before uh, 1914. Uh, I don't think we should, uh, on that basis, say it's not a concerning thing. I mean, that still has some consequences. And of course, those levels of inequality at that time were only really supportable usually within political systems which were not fully democratic. And when they became fully democratic, there were political responses to that inequality that demanded change. I think the other thing which is interesting, which the Piketty book, uh, Capital, has illustrated, is that on the wealth to income ratios as well, we've gone back to where we were in the 18th century. And then in particular, on one that particularly interests me on this, if you look within Piketty's data about where wealth resides, in 1800, it primarily resided in land, land as agricultural capital. Mm -hmm. By 1930 or 1950, land had declined in importance. And one of the things which is quite extraordinary over the last 30 or 40 years is that we've returned to an environment where real estate value, but it is ultimately the land on which it sits, has again soared uh, in importance. 
And a, it's quite interesting to see that in a number of ways, our economies and societies now have greater similarity with some of the patterns of the 19th and 18th century than they do with that period of sort of 1950 to 70. But 1950 to 70, let's remember, for many people in advanced economies, felt like a golden age of increasing prosperity, uh, widely enough spread across the whole of society that it felt by it felt like rising tide really was rising raising old boats, and it doesn't feel like that any longer. And we need to think about why. So let's talk a little bit more about this real estate issue because it connects the dots not only on the on the inequality but also on the low real interest rates. Why do you think there's a there's a return to to so much wealth being placed in in real estate? What drives that change or well, that let, return? Well, let me start with the low real interest rates. And I think the issue thing is, you know, why did interest rates come down so much? Now, it, clearly, if interest rates, you know, come down, we, we must assume that there was some change in the uh, ex-ante balance between ex-ante desired savings and investment. And of course, Ben Bernanke in 2005 talked about a savings glut hypothesis. Mm -hmm. um, there is an alternative hypothesis that one of the things that's gone on over the last 20 years uh, is that actually there are many forms of high technology business which don't require much investment. Let me give you an example. I mean, I, I, I won't be up to date because I haven't looked at the last two days of falling high tech yeah. prices, but at least when I looked at it two weeks ago, Facebook was worth $170 billion. A couple of billion less today. But... A couple of billion less today, but still a lot. Yes. Let's say a lot. Facebook's machine, the software which runs it, as best I can work out, uh, required an investment of something like 5,000 software engineer man years. You end up with a machine, a business worth 170 billion for 5,000 engineer man years investments. That's $34 million per man year invested. As a ratio, this is completely different from what went on when Henry Ford was building his car factories. Before he could deliver cars to the American people, an enormous amount of investment had to go into mm -hmm. the, 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 the car factories and the steel foundries that made the steel that went into the car. So we have a phenomenon in the high-tech world of enormous wealth creation with very little investment. Now, of course, that means that there isn't actually much demand for investable funds in some bits of high-tech business. We know that many forms of capital equipment are falling in relative price relative to current prices, uh, and therefore business investment is actually falling as a percentage. That may help explain lower real interest rates, but of course those lower real interest rates then create an incentive for people to borrow the money simply to leverage up against real estate assets. But there's also, I think, some drivers of an inherent demand for real estate going on in any case. And what do you think drives that in? Well, demand? essentially, as we get richer, there are some things where there is a high income elasticity of demand and somewhere there's a low income elasticity of demand. I mean, most of us are perfectly happy having one washing machine. We don't buy two or three or four washing machines. But most of us have an almost limitless ability to, to compete with other people for the right to live in the nice parts of town. I think the competition for the positional good, which is a house or apartment in the right, right, part, right part, nice parts of town, is a high income elasticity good. Now, what you then have is that then trends to drive up rents as a percentage of income. If simultaneously you've got a fall in real risk-free interest rates, those rents are capitalized at a higher level. That then produces a period of rising real estate prices. That then, however, produces an expectational change where people think, oh, I better invest in that, I better get on the housing ladder, I better borrow money. That then links to the fact that the easiest thing against which to leverage is real estate because it's a nice lazy thing for the banking system to lend money against because you don't actually have to read. Simple collateral. You, you have simple collateral uh, with alternative use value. You don't have to read a specific business plan to make the decision. All of this, I think, drives a huge tendency, which I think is inherent, whereby the share of real estate, and what we're now talking is no longer land as an agricultural food production capital, but urban real estate, I think it tends to increase as a percentage of, of our national wealth. But that then has a, a, a major implication. It has a wonderful irony, which is the more that we live in a high-tech world where we can automate things away, the more that our wealth resides in the most 
physical and old-fashioned thing of all, which is material land. And this is part of going back to the 18th century? Which is part of going back to the 18th century. I mean, here, here's a wonderful irony. Um, the, in the UK, there was a recent report uh, that pointed out that there were five people whose total wealth uh, exceeded the wealth of the dot bottom quintile of the population. Now, what's interesting about two of those two people is that they are the Duke of Westminster and the Earl of Cadogan, who are fundamentally rich because they happen to own the, the fields over which land ex uh, London expanded in the course of the 18th and 19th century. So we're back, back in time. We're sort of back to the past. Now we just want to build, bring back the economics of those times. Well, that's of course interesting, that the focus on land value and on rents, which was fundamental to Ricardo, mm -hmm. so Ricardo uh, talked about capital and labor, but he also talked about land and rents, is something that we sort of moved away from. Uh, that whole thinking about positional goods uh, and things which are in finite supply and where when demand goes up against them, only the price can go up, really isn't present in an awful lot of modern macroeconomics. It's not present in dynamic stochastic general equilibrium models. It's not present in ways that we think about what the finance system is doing. And so we, we need to put that back into economics simply to understand what the hell is going on. I mean, even as, as late as Keynes, you know, the focus on, on his analysis of inflation was at least in part on how that affected a society that had gotten used to the rentier state. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I mean, he, he, he talked about rentiers as, as being theirs. And we, because the rentiers disappeared... They, the, the wars you know, did away. The, the, the wars did away from them. Uh, we weren't aware of that. But in a sense, we are returning to an environment where enormous amounts of wealth uh, arise from the accumulation of land values. Do you think there is anything, when you talk about position uh, goods and specifically with with real estate in urban centers do you think there is part of this that has to do with the geopolitical value of having an asset in one of those places where you know we've seen in, in cities like London yeah. or New York Vancouver a lot of people from abroad that want to say buy insurance do you think there that also that, affects that, that the market? That is part of it I think what, what, what's interesting is even aside from that I'll come back to it what is striking is that this tendency for the increase in urban land value it is not equally the case across all economies. Right. For instance, it's much more the case in France and Britain than it is in Germany. And what you've got is a very different, different urban geography and social terms. There is a very strong tendency in both France and uh, the UK. UK for the income elite to congregate in one city, you know, Paris or, or, or London, and to drive up the price of a, a, a property in those. And you just don't see that in Germany with its, its multiple urban centres. They mm -hmm. haven't got the same effect. You're absolutely right that what you also see is once it becomes the case that for a set of fundamental reasons of consumer preference and low interest rates and finite supply that assets, it looks like a good... Uh, a, a, asset class in which to invest, mm -hmm. it becomes an international asset class. And quite clearly we are seeing in London, in New York, in Vancouver. The extraordinary phenomenon of real estate often bought almost just like an arbitrary token. If you go past some of the major developments of the most expensive real estate in London now, you will find that there is not a single light on mm -hmm. in the evening because nobody is living there. They have bought it for 10 or 20 million pounds because they believe that at least the 10 or 20 million pounds will be politically secure from expropriation, and they hope that it'll go up to 30 million, you know, it'll appreciate. But actually, this thing is no longer primarily as a place to actually go and stay in. And that emergence, now that is, that's a very top end effect. Yeah, yes. And I think the key point to understand about what is happening in property generally, it's a wider effect than that. It's an effect that is affecting a, you know, a wide slice of you know, the top 10%, the top half of the population. Mm -hmm. but, but that is the extreme version, is this, uh, you know, the apartment in Vancouver, in, in London, in New York, which is almost a sort of an arbitrary token of wealth. It's, you know, it's like a tulip. In, 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 in the Holland of uh, So that leads me to the question, do you think that could lead to a bubble? Oh, of course it can lead to a bubble. Um, I, I think one of the most important things we have to understand in economics is that we have a relationship between something in infinite supply and something in finite supply. The thing that is infinite supply is credit and money. Because, again, something we, we forgot in modern macroeconomics. We forgot the fundamental insight that banks create credit and money in purchasing power, and as Vixel and others described, left to themselves, they can create infinite amounts. Alongside that, 
we have something which is uh, in, uh, either in absolute fixed supply or at least extremely inelastic supply, which is desirable urban land. Now, whenever you put together in economics something in infinite supply and something in finite supply, uh, you have a set of supply and demand curves where the intersection is extremely indeterminate. Right. Um, and therefore, you end up with something which is inherently capable of driving uh, booms and busts. I mean, we saw that in Japan in the late 1980s, an extraordinary phenomenon mm -hmm. uh, in that case of a credit-driven drive. There it was primarily commercial real estate. It was a bit uh, residential real estate as well. But we know that we have this extraordinary capacity in the real estate markets for banking systems to fuel uh, booms and then busts. But the trouble is the busts leave us with debt overhangs, which then leave us in Fisher-type deleveraging situations. And also for, for the perception, at least, a popular perception that those asset prices cannot go down or that they cannot go down in the same way that a stock price can go down or a bond can be defaulted upon. Do you think, do you, is it part of the irony that you know, we've gone to a, from a world of, of wanting to promote property owning democracy to a world in which the real estate um, boom can lead to certain inefficiencies and potentially asset bubbles? Well, it can lead to asset bubbles. It can also, by the way, lead to inequality even of home exactly. ownership. I mean, one of the intriguing things that's happening in the UK is that home ownership as a percentage of the population peaked in the late 1990s and is now falling. One of the reasons why it's falling is a boom of buy to let. Because one of the things that easy credit availability does is that it makes access to credit, who can demand credit, hugely determinant of who gets the asset price appreciation. And if you are a person uh, with a bit more wealth to start off with, mm -hmm. either to start off with initially or because you've done well out of the first steps of the process, you are able to borrow money more cheaply than other people because you have a higher equity and a loan, lower loan to value ratio. So we are seeing this extraordinary phenomenon in Britain of uh, the, the, the growth of buy to let with a group of people who are simply eating up more and more of the housing stock because they can borrow money to buy it more effectively than people who don't yet uh, own it. So we're seeing the average age of entry into the housing uh, uh, market uh, going later and later and a growth of buy to let. We've also seen the phenomenon that if you look at the impact of the last 15 years of the housing boom and bust in the UK, mm -hmm. it has been deeply unequal. Mm -hmm. The people who lost money were the people who were most highly leveraged, because right. those were the people who, when the downturn came, were most likely to fall into negative equity, most likely to be repossessed, and therefore most likely to lose the opportunity of participating in the subsequent boom. Right. So I think we have to live with an irony, which I think is true in the US as well, that a set of policies that politicians thought were deeply equalizing in terms of wealth, mm -hmm. based upon making sure that there was lots of credit for housing supply, can have uh, some unintended consequences of actually increasing the inequality of the distribution of wealth ownership. So changing gears a little bit, um, we are, it seems that the worst of the Eurozone crisis has passed. Greece is printing money at 5%, Ireland has exited its bailout, there's rumor that Portugal will follow suit and Spain is, seems to be booming, at least you know, cool. decreasing, mm -hmm. decreasing um, unemployment and recovering. Where do you see Europe going for the next, or over the next five years? Well, I think there are some recoveries, but I think we're a long, long way from a sustained strong recovery. Um, and my worry for Europe over the next five or ten years is that it's somewhat like Japan in the 1990s, mm -hmm. but with that being much more politically difficult in Europe, because I think a sustained period of uh, very low uh, inflation or even deflation and very low growth is much more problematically in a society with large immigrant populations and ethnic heterogeneity like Europe than it is in a deeply homogeneous society uh, like Japan, where you are less likely to get the response of movements to the far right, anti-immigration movements, etc. So I think we are still dealing in Europe with a very, very deep problem of a debt overhang. Mm -hmm. uh, we have high levels of public debt, which are therefore uh, seeming to necessitate a public uh, fiscal consolidation combined with high levels of private debt. So, you know, how many Irish people are out there going to borrow new money and buy houses? Well, they're not because they're still dealing with the high levels of mortgage debt that they have in the past. Uh, right. Many Italian uh, corporates are quite highly mortgaged, uh, quite highly leveraged. And I think we have, I think what we've had with Mario Draghi's statement in 2012 is a very successful demonstration that a central bank which is determined 
can take tail risk off the table, mm -hmm. even without any doing something, even by just saying that it will do something. And it was a very the do whatever it takes. Boosting. The, the do whatever it takes was very successful. Mm -hmm. But I don't think we have a clear path to deal with this debt overhang. I do think that we are facing, you know, what the IMF has now labelled, if not deflation, lowflation. Mm -hmm. And I am worried that the ECB is leaving the response late to that. I think all the experience from Japan in the 1990s shows that if in a period of balance sheet recession, debt overhang, you begin to see the development of deflation, you have to respond early because if it gets embedded, it gets just more and more difficult to deal with. Yes. So I think the big worry is that within the particular structure of the Eurozone and the political difficulties of it, the ECB has enough power and degrees of freedom to take the tail risk off the table and to avoid default and exit and breakup, but not enough degrees of freedom and power to make sure that we avoid a decade of lowflation and very low growth. So last question, because we're running out of time. Do you, do you see the United Kingdom, where you come from, in this Europe or outside of this Europe? Well, the UK is outside of the Euro. Of so course, no, but I mean... What are we going to do on the European Union? Yeah. Um, I, I don't know. Um, I think probably a reasonable person debt betting would be to say that when we get round to that uh, referendum, if we get round to it, I would say it's 70% likely that we'll stay in, 30% likely that we'll move out. But 30% is non-trivial. And 30% is high enough that you can have a, a development of... Uh, popular opinion where it could go the other way. I mean, the thing that you have to understand about where UKIP, the UK Independence Party, mm -hmm. gets its, its votes from, the core issue is actually immigration. I mean, let's be blunt, that's what gets people worked up. And it's very difficult to answer that because if you're in the European Union, free movement of people is one of the core freedoms of the European... Uh, and it doesn't look likely that other leaders would change that. I think it's almost impossible to change that. I mean, you can tighten up on things to do like welfare payment access, but welfare payment access is almost irrelevant. Most immigrants are there to work. Correct. I mean, immigrants, on average, are harder working, more motivated people than non-immigrants. That's okay. what they are throughout the world. So the welfare access thing is pretty much of a red herring. The trouble is that immigration, and I think this is somewhere where the, the sort of liberal elites have been guilty, mm -hmm. we have tended to say immigration isn't a problem. Well, any reasonable theory of the determination of, of wages and, and trade will tell you that if you let large flows of unskilled immigration in, that will be good for uh, the better off person mm -hmm. buying their coffee at, uh, at Starbucks and not good for the person, you know, working at the minimum wage or close to the minimum wage, you know, in a coffee shop. And I think we've been in the liberal elite, you know, far too sort of blasé about the impact uh, of immigration. And it's partly come back to bite us. Lord Turner, thank you very much for all your work with Ina. Thank you very much for being here and for your time today. Thanks.